All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today we have Priya, Dr. Jay Singhni with us. She is a another, so we always have the rock star. So here is a rock, rock star from endocrinology. She is working in New York right now. I'll give you her bio. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Singhni or Priya, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Mobin. It's such a pleasure. Thank you very much for being here. So I'm going to quickly read out your bio and then we'll start. The For the cool beans who are listening in, the discussions are going to be about diabetes. I am hoping that with Priya, we will go over various topics of diabetes and create a series for you in which we'll talk about what is diabetes, what are the clinical examination points for diabetes. Then we'll go for the physiology, pathology, clinical sides of it, complications, prognosis and management. So I think whenever we could, every week, every two weeks, we'll continue to present. So with this uh, plan, let's start. The introduction for Dr. Uh, Jay Singhni or Priya is the following. He's a board certified internal medicine physician. She completed her training at Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson, New Jersey, and is currently completing her fellowship in endocrinology at New York Presbyterian Will Cornell, New York. Priya received a distinction in service to the community through her work at the Boggs Center in medical school and was inducted into the AOA Honor Society in 2019 during her residency. She also serves on the board of directors of mental health organization called SAMHIN, which is a South Asian mental health initiative and network. Dr. Jay Singhni plans to focus her career on diabetes and I also and obesity and the medicine around that while continuing to be an advocate for minority health and mental health. She also has a privilege of serving serving India remotely during the second surge of COVID-19 with her work being featured in the Times of India and Medscape. And she has the links in the description as well. So at this young age, at this early part of your career, you have so many accomplishments. I can only see you growing and succeeding more and more. So more power to you. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much, Dr. Mobin. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I'm so happy to be, uh, you know, doing the session on diabetes and the clinical examination of it. So I think, uh, you know, we'll begin. But thank you so much Let's for the start. introduction. Um, so just for all of the cool beans that are here. Um, so I'm pretty interesting. I'm currently an endocrinology fellow. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about the clinical examination of diabetes. Um, so, you know, just a quick intro. So diabetes mellitus refers to a group of common metabolic disorders that share the phenotype of hyperglycemia. So in the U.S., um, diabetes is actually the leading cause of end-stage renal disease, non-traumatic um, lower extremity amputations, and also adult blindness. And, you know, it has a lot of macro and micro um, uh, vascular complications that basically predispose people to cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, peripheral um, vascular disease, retinopathy, um, you know, neuropathy, nephropathy. And according to, you know, the National Diabetes Statistics Report um, for 2020, about 34 million Americans, so about one in 10 people have diabetes. And 80 million Americans also have um, pre-diabetes in addition to that. So that's about one in three people with an A1C of about 5.7 to 6.4. Um, so, you know, this is why this topic is so important because these are patients that we're gonna be seeing in our offices daily. And, you know, just going into a little bit more detail, there are several distinct types of diabetes. And, you know, they can kind of, um, be shaped through a person's genetics and their environmental factors um, that they encounter as well. So we're just going to go through two types today just to keep it brief because we want to step into the clinical exam. But, you know, there's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is autoimmune. And it's um, often when there's a destruction of pancreatic beta cells that leads to an absolute insulin deficiency. 
And so there's little to no insulin production, essentially, and they're very ketosis prone at that point. And type 2 diabetes usually um, is due to progressive loss of insulin secretion from the beta cells. And that's usually superimposed on a background of insulin resistance. So in that case, um, you know, there's also factors like incretin hormones that can, you know, potentiate um, glucose and uh, stimulated insulin secretion from beta cells. And so in type 2 diabetes, beta cell responsiveness to some of these incretin um, hormones may be reduced, like with um, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide or GIP. Or and Priya, with, can I, yes. uh, sorry for the interruption, can I ask you a quick question here? Yeah. Uh, I know that you're in the beginning, but this is a thing that is stuck in my head for a long time. Yeah. For the type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. is it a must that all of us are going to develop it? Is it connected to lifestyle and food? And if our food is better during our young ages, uh, can we push the occurrence of start of the diabetes later, later meaning how does our lifestyle and diabetes occur and is this a hundred percent thing that would happen to everyone as we age so there that's a great question dr mobi you know there's such a huge interplay between type 2 diabetes and nutrition and you know as the the rates of um being overweight or living with obesity have gone up we've also seen that the rates of type 2 diabetes have also gone up so you know truly i would say nutrition and physical activity are actually cornerstones of um you know also preventative and active treatment of diabetes you know um hopefully it's something that we all don't develop um i know a lot of us have you know predispositions to it with certain lifestyle factors other comorbidities um even our ethnicity um, so, you know, I think as long as we engage in um, certain lifestyle modifications um, to prevent that as much as possible, that would be a good start. Um, because, you know, for example, like physical inactivity, smoking, um, you know, over excessive alcohol use, um, all of these things, you know, they contribute about 60% of premature death and lead to chronic diseases like you know, type two diabetes, CBD. So I think if we mitigate those factors, then we can at least, you know, um, push the front of when we may be diagnosed uh, with it, it. we are going to be. One more question, my apologies. I know that you're- No, that's okay. One more question. So Jim here, uh, one of our cool beans, he's saying, do you believe type three diabetes or diabetes of the brain is Alzheimer's? So that's a good question. There's a lot of, um, you know, it's it's actually a good thing that you brought that up. There's a whole spectrum, like I was saying, of diabetes. You know, there are, there's um, Modi, there's Lada, there's type 1.5, there's, um, you know, gestational diabetes, there's now drug-induced diabetes, chemical-induced diabetes. I don't quite know if it's certainly the cause of Alzheimer's, but what I can say is because there's so much involvement um, you know, cerebrovascularly and through the vascular system in the brain, you know, it could very well be contributing, you know, we'll see later on the lecture, there's so many inflammatory states also, you know, when it comes to um, diabetes. So I, I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they found a connection to that later on. Got it. Thank you very much. Please uh, continue. My apologies for these no interruptions. No problem. No problem. So, um, you know, we were talking about type 2 diabetes and beta cell responsiveness, and that's generally reduced um, with certain incretin hormones like GIP and GLP in type 2 diabetes. And I think one other, um, you know, thing that a lot of us might have studied when it comes to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, initially, you know, type 1 was known to be more so in younger individuals and type 2 was known to be in the older population, but that's not so anymore, right? We see people who develop diabetes from, you know, drugs, whether that's, you know, treatment with, uh, for HIV or AIDS, or if they're on immunotherapies for cancers, or if they're on glucocorticoids, or even surgeries, right? Iatrogenically, if it's, you know, post-transplant, or if it's from a distal pancreatectomy, from having pancreatitis, um, so, or post-Whipple, there are so many different procedures that can kind of lead to that type one type of phenomenon even later in life. So it's not really an age determined thing. And then for both types, you know, like we were mentioning, lifestyle modification is essential. 
And then type ones, you know, are definitely um, required to be treated with insulin. And for type two, you know, they, they can be treated with oral agents, but they may have to be on insulin at some point. So, uh, you know, Dr. Mobin is so funny because at one point I was asked, um, you know, by a medical student, like what components of a physical exam do you even do, hmm. you know, for diabetes? And the truth is, I think often, you know, um, people miss out on actually identifying one particular point of the physical exam because the physical exam for diabetes is all encompassing. You know, the metabolic dysregulation that's associated with diabetes causes so much um, secondary pathophysiology that it basically affects every single organ system. And that's why going back to that previous question, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of, you know, effects even cerebrovascularly when it came to ties with Alzheimer's and, you know, eventual types of diabetes that we discover. So I guess with that, you know, we can just dive right in. So for me, you know, the physical exam always starts with the vitals. So, you know, blood pressure is measured on every clinical visit, and it should be for patients with diabetes. So I have three different categories listed here, you know, hypertension, orthostatic, hypotension, and hypotension. So, you know, you're probably wondering, well, this is a whole range. How can they all be related to diabetes? So we're going to walk through them. So, you know, why does hypertension matter? Well, hypertension can accelerate complications of diabetes. So particularly, you know, cardiovascular disease and nephropathy. And it's also a risk factor for diseases like OSA, which actually increase risk and severity of diabetes. So, you know, it's very essential that when you find a patient who has um, been diagnosed with high blood pressure and it also has diabetes, that they're, you know, treated with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So it's important to note that they have high blood pressure because it actually changes your management. And that's specifically to decrease, you know, the risks of, of the things that we were mentioning, you know, CVD, stroke, CKD. So for individuals, with diabetes and hypertension who have a higher cardiovascular risk or an ASCVD greater than 15, um, the blood pressure target is usually 130 over 80. And then for individuals who have diabetes and hypertension at a lower cardiovascular risk, so an ASCVD less than 15%, we usually treat with a blood pressure target of less than 140 over 90. So blood pressure targets should be individualized um, through a decision-making process that addresses their cardiovascular risk, um, you know, potential adverse effects with antihypertensives, their previous medical history um, that might make them more high risk. So you might need tighter control. Like for example, if someone who had a previous stroke or, you know, has progressive CKD, or you might need a more lax goal. Like for example, individuals were, you know, between 65 and 85. So, and it also depends, you know, on the patient preferences. So that's why, you know, hypertension is important. Um, Got it. And then, Priya, one more quick interjection. My apologies. No problem. So uh, for the folks who are listening in, uh, the topic today is the diabetes and the physical examination of it. Mm -hmm. We would continue with the classification and other parts later on as well. So for if sure. you can keep your focus we'll on this one it. for the audience. And Priya, there is a quick question here from yes. a regular Didi. They say, is gut dysbiosis due to parasites and food intolerances triggered by our food choices also a reason why we have higher type 2 diabetes incidences? I thought it is interesting to connect back to the type 1 and type 2 before we continue. So uh, what, do, what do you think? Is the food and pathogens co contributing to T2 as well? So I actually haven't looked into specifically with parasites, you know, and dysbiosis, if that would cause an increase in incidence of type 2 diabetes. Um, so that's actually an interesting thought. And I wouldn't mind actually looking into that and maybe sending you a message, Dr. Mobin, about that and seeing if there's actually any connection between that. Got it. Thank you very much. And once again, sorry for the interjection, please. Uh... No problem. So then the next thing you want to note is if the patient ever has orthostatic blood pressure. So you know, if you have a patient coming in, they go from a supine to upright um, position and their blood pressure, you know, has a change of more than 20 over 10 um, millimeters of mercury, then they have orthostatic blood pressure. And how does that relate to diabetes? Well, they might have diabetic autonomic neuropathy. So that's one thing to consider as well. And it's funny enough, sometimes we can induce it ourselves through treatment. So there's actually treatment induced neuropathy of diabetes. 
And then we can talk about that as well. But that basically has to refer to the magnitude of change in their A1C and how quickly it's achieved. Um, and then hypotension. So why is that important when it comes to a patient who may be presenting with diabetes? Well, you know, hypotension, um, especially in situations with severe, you know, hyperglycemia or in patients who have DKA, they have a lot of glucose urea. And so they're especially volume depleted. Um, and, you know, especially with the combination of peripheral, or peripheral vasodilation, we need to make sure that we, you know, hydrate them and um, keep them uh, to keep their volume balanced. So that was more about blood pressure. And I guess we'll move on to some of the other vitals. So, you know, heart rate, tachycardia can also, um, you know, come from volume depletion. But at the same time, you know, there's also cardiovascular autonomic neuropathy and people can have resting tachycardia. The other vital that we look to, like to look at when it comes to diabetes is the respiratory rate. So you may have a patient present who is in respiratory distress, who's tachypnic, and something that you should always keep in mind is Kussmaul breathing. So that's actually a deep and labored breathing pattern, which is often associated with a severe metabolic acidosis, which can be seen in DKA, for example. So that is actually a form of hyperventilation um, that tries to blow off as much carbon dioxide through increased um, rate of respiration and even depth of respiration. So initially, you know, it's very rapid and shallow breaths, but as the acidosis worsens, the breathing pattern becomes deep, labored, and gas-like. And you may even notice that, you know, your patient, um, if they're in DK, may even have a fruity odor to their breath, you know, and that's secondary to the metabolic acidosis and the increased acetone. So these are all signs of, of that disorder. The other vital that we like to look at and monitor along the way in patients who have diabetes is, you know, their weight. And I've mentioned both weight gain and weight loss. So, you know, drastic weight loss is something that we often see when patients come in with newly diagnosed diabetes. So that's something that you should always ask about. And it's very important to, you know, monitor uh, the graph and change in their weights. You know, every visit you should measure the height and weight and calculate BMI um, for a patient and assess their weight trajectory. The other important thing is a waist to hip ratio, which is actually a very reliable predictor of type 2 diabetes. And, you know, um, the ADA even lists, you know, diet, physical activity, and behavioral therapy with the goal of, you know, maintaining about 5% weight loss for patients with type 2 diabetes who are overweight. So that would, you know, be a BMI of greater than 25. And then the Endocrine Society also mentions, you know, other pharmacotherapies, for example, if someone's BMI is greater than 27 or um, with a comorbidity or if it's greater than 30. And then, of course, you can even consider things like bariatric surgery if their BMI is greater than 35 with a comorbidity or if it's greater than 40. So now let's move to general appearance. Hmm. When, a, when a person first presents, um, you know, it's very important to know how their medication is. Are they awake and alert? Are they ANO times three? Are they confused? Are they lethargic? And you know, it's it's very strange because if I didn't have the sugar in front of me, you know, sometimes with with those symptoms, it can be either hypo or hyperglycemia, right? So even for example, in DK, a patient can present to you altered, but that may be because, for example, they have sepsis, which triggered their DK. The other thing is you want to make sure that your patient's actually conscious and not comatose, because we see that often in in patients who present with HHS, right? So the prototypical patient with HHS is usually an individual with type 2 diabetes coming in with polyuria, weight loss, very dehydrated with hyperosmolarity, and they're often, you know, comatose or very, very confused and lethargic. Now, again, when we're looking at physical appearance, we'll go, you know, through each system and we'll go head to toe. So from the head, you know, another thing that we look at is xanthalesmas. So, you know, hyperlipidemia in association with insulin resistance is very common in patients with type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance and kind of the ensuing hyperinsulinemia that's associated with hypertriglyceridemia um, comes about because of this overproduction of TG-rich lipoproteins in the liver. And there's also, you know, increased substrate availability. And sometimes there's even a defective catabolism of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. 
So that increases the LDL and usually lowers the HDL. And so you can see sequelae of hyperlipidemia like xantho xanthalesmas. The other complication we can often see is, you know, from diabetic nephropathy. So, you know, patients can sometimes present with periorbital edema, which we can see. And, you know, with that, you also have diabetic retinopathy, which can present as blurry vision. Patients also often have cataracts. They have glaucoma. And, you know, cranial nerve neuropathies are also a rare long-term complication. And the prevalence of it usually depends on the severity as well as the duration of the hyperglycemia. So typically, you know, the, the cranial nerve palsy is a result of, you know, um, the microvasculopathy from uncontrolled hyperglycemia. And um, I think one of the most commonly encountered uh, cranial mononeuropathies secondary to diabetes is usually cranial nerve three or, you know, the oculomotor nerve. Um, the other ones that we see are, you know, cranial nerve um, six, um, as well as four. So abducens and then the trochlear. So among patients with mononeuropathies, it's often been reported that um, patients who have, for example, oculomotor motor nerve palsy secondary to all the causes, diabetes usually accounts for about like 11%. So it's, you know, in that range. So it's something to look out for. So what would so you- can I interject quick interjection with one more question it's a good question related to the points you're making uh well the you says does diabetes cause certain onset of eye misalignment do, do not know the term is there a possibility of squint or other motor movement issues with diabetes so there can definitely be motor movement issues because cranial nerve three innervates majority of the muscles controlling eye movement. So about four out of six extraocular muscles are actually all controlled by cranial nerve three. So everything except for the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. And even, you know, the upper eyelid is also controlled by cranial nerve three. So the lev levator palpebri. And what you'll see with like misalignment, maybe what you're referring to is that down and out type of phenomena that we see. So the, out, the eye is usually displaced you know, outward, and it has extropia, and it can also be displaced downward. So you can, you can have hypotropia. And, you know, the reason it's, it's outward is because of, you know, the lateral rectus. Um, and, you know, it's downward because of the superior oblique, you know. So those are two reasons you can have, you know, misalignment with down and out. And then the other thing we can see is, you know, with cranial three is, is ptosis. So that's the other thing we can see. Got it. Thank you very much. No problem. So I guess with um, with cranial nerve three palsies, you know, you could see um, down and out phenomena and the ptosis. The thing that you know is something to keep in mind is the difference between I would say pupil sparing and pupil involving ocular motor um, nerve palsies. So if you see someone who comes in within ophthalmoplegia ptosis and mydriasis, you should actually be thinking more of a compressive etiology. And the reason that is, is because the pupillary fibers usually occupy a peripheral location. And so they receive more collateral blood flow um, from the main trunk of the nerve. And that's why, you know, it's usually compressive lesions, um, such as, you know, intracranial aneurysms that can cause that mydriasis. So, um, you know, with diabetes, you would see more of the ischemic phenomenon. And then with pupillary dilation, it would be more of compression. So that's something to keep in mind as well when you're observing someone's eyes. Got it. And then, you know, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness um, between the age of 20 and 74 in the U.S. And individuals with diabetes are about 25 more times likely um, to become legally blind than than individuals without diabetes. So, you know, diabetic retinopathy on fundoscopic exam um, is also something to look out for. So, you know, diabetic retinopathy usually disrupts the normal interaction of the, you know, retinal, neural, and vascular components. And it leads to a vascular permeability, uh, neurovascularization, and, you know, loss of proper neural function. 
So on a fundoscopic exam, um, retinopathy is usually classified into two stages. So it's usually non-proliferative um, versus proliferative disease. So we can take a look at that. So here we see, you know, there's usually a progression we can see here between not having any diabetic neuropathy, then progressing to non-proliferative, and then to proliferative disease. And there's a couple of differences, you know, with um, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it usually appears in the first decade or early in the second decade of the disease. And it's usually marked by retinal vascular microaneurysms, blot hemorrhages, and cotton wool spots. And we kind of saw that here as well in the in the the picture on the right. And you know, pathophysiologically, that's from retinal ischemia, and you know, increased retinal vascular permeability, alterations in blood flow, um, abnormal microvasculature, and so all of this eventually can lead to macular edema. And we see macular edema both in the non-proliferative and in the proliferative disease. So um, that can be found in both. And then it. it can progress to proliferative um, diabetic retinopathy. And that's when we really see the, the formation of like new vessels, so neovascularization. And that's usually in response to the retinal hypoxia that we were seeing prior. So vessels you know, can often rupture easily and that can lead to hemorrhage as well or fibrosis, but the you know, the more grave complication that we usually worry about is retinal detachment. And what would your patient be telling you at that point? They would be describing possibly seeing floaters, flashes, um, black spots, and then maybe a decrease in their peripheral vision and then central vision as well. Hmm. Can I uh, interject with two more questions? Sure. One question related to the... Um, eyes and, and the topic there. And another question is a little bit forward towards the leg. So you can you answer now or at that time. So the question for the eyes, Bambi Secret says, Dr. Wien Medical Lectures, do these cranial nerve three problems also cause upper eyelid twitching? So they cause ptosis, meaning drooping of that eyelid. Got it. Thank you. And the second question uh, was about the cellulitis. So one second, I'm just looking for it. Sure. So the question scrolled away. The question was something to this effect that in, in a newly diagnosed diabetes, is it possible that there is cellulitis in the legs? Edema yes. and cellulitis. I got it. Yes. So Cheryl says, is it common for a newly diagnosed type 2 to present with advanced edema and cellulitis in bilateral lower extremities? Yeah, so infections of the skin are much more common in type 2 diabetes than they are even in patients with diabetes than they are in the common population. So if you find someone who's having recurrent infections such as that, then you should definitely test them for diabetes as well. Got it. Thank you very much. No problem. So that was kind of the eyes. Um, and we'll talk more about the legs and the skin later as well. So right now, let's go to the mouth and the mucosa. So, you know, when we take a look at someone who is coming in, for example, with a lot of hyperglycemia, um, they may have osmotic diuresis leading to polyuria, which will, you know, of course, make them extremely dry. And, you know, that's why people describe that extreme thirst or the polydipsia that we're often told about. And so, again, the key is to hydrate. And if you inspect the mouth, you know, you'll see as in the graphic here, you can see, um, you know, the tongue is very dry. You'll see, you know, the lips are cracked, um, things like that. The other thing to look for in the mouth itself is um, gingivitis or periodontitis. So we're just talking about infections. You know, diabetics are predisposed to infections, um, you know, everywhere, not only, for example, on their skin and their legs, but also in their oral cavity. And the other thing you might see is like a buildup of plaque or puffy red gum, uh, gums. You know, so that's something else you can look out for. Um, and then I guess moving from the mouth into the neck area, you know, we talked a lot about vascular disease and complications from that. So when you, you know, for example, check the carotid pulse, you may hear a brewery, you know, suggested more of atherosclerosis. 
And then, of course, in the neck, there is also the thyroid, um, which is another one of our um, favorite glands to, um, you know, really inspect and also palpate. And the reason we want to make sure that we actually do a thorough neck exam and also evaluate the thyroid is because thyroid disorders um, remain the most frequent autoimmune disorders associated with type 1 diabetes. So, you know, even now there's very common susceptibility genes that have been acknowledged to confer, you know, um, risk of development for um, type 1 uh, diabetes and then autoimmune thyroid disease. And um, there have even been shown, you know, in some studies that positive TPO antibodies have been reported in diabetic individuals, for example, up to, I would say, onwards of 40%. And that's why, you know, um, you'll see it's important to monitor on physical exam as well as um, with blood work to see if they have any clinical or subclinical thyroid disease. Um, so another thing to watch out for is, you know, sequelae of hyperthyroidism, for example, because it's long recognized to promote hyperglycemia. So the reason that is, is because um, the half-life of insulin is reduced, uh, most likely uh, secondary to the increased degradation and enhanced release of biologically inactive, you know, insulin precursors. And when hyperthyroidism, there's also endogenous production of glucose that's also enhanced. And interestingly, just to take a slight segue um, to, you know, more of the pathophys, thyroid hormone um, can actually produce an increase in hepatocyte plasma membrane concentrations of GLUT2. And GLUT2 is actually one of the main glucose transporters in the liver. So that can lead to more hepatic glucose output and also abnormal glucose metabolism. And then, of course, there's other ways that, you know, hyperthyroidism can lead to hyperglycemia. So there's increased gut absorption and things like that. Hypothyroidism, on the other hand, you know, usually you'll see patients coming in with a decrease in their insulin requirement. And that's because there's a reduced rate of liver glucose production. So oftentimes you'll see people coming in with recurrent hypoglycemic episodes as a presenting sign for the development of hypothyroidism in patients with type 1 diabetes. And it's actually been shown that if you replace with thyroid hormone, um, there's reduced fluctuations in the blood glucose. And Mr. So the next... Um, you know, place that we usually look for um, signs and sequelae of diabetes is in the axilla. So, you know, very common phenomenon that we see is acanthosis nigricans. And, you know, acanthosis nigricans actually, along with being associated with diabetes, is also associated with obesity, acromegaly, Cushing's. Um, and it can be found not only in the axilla, but also over the neck um, and the inframammary regions. And it's a very wart-like, you know, pathologous hyperplasia of the skin. And it's associated, you know, with a lot of insulin resistance. And it's proposed that, you know, in insulin resistant states, the hyperinsulinemia usually competes for insulin-like growth factor receptors on the keratinocytes. And that's what stimulates epidermal growth and then you have this appearance of hyperpigmentation and velvety skin that we see with acanthosis nigricans. So then moving from the axilla, we can go to the belly or the abdomen. So the abdomen is a very common injection site for insulin. And, you know, there is a disorder that can afflict um, subcutaneous fat called lipodystrophy. And it can result in two different types. Um, you know, lipoatrophy and lipohypertrophy. So, um, you know, one of them is not so common anymore, and that would be lipoatrophy, because, you know, before the advent of recombinant human insulin, um, insulin-induced lipoatrophy was a common problem um, amongst insulin users. And lipoatrophy is actually the localized loss of subcutaneous fat. And, um, the prevalence before with um, animal insulins was quite high. It was anywhere from, you know, 25 to maybe 55 percent. And, you know, fortunately with human insulin now, that's more of a rare complication. But we do see lipohypertrophy, and that's more of the increased localized 
um, you know, adipose tissue that's usually seen at injection sites secondary to more of the lipogenic effect of insulin. And the prevalence is also quite high. It's 20 to 30 percent in people with type 1 diabetes um, who are using human insulin. So, you know, just taking a look at the picture here with the red arrow, you know, it's demonstrating the lipoatrophy. And with the blue arrow, we can see the lipohypertrophy. And usually, you know, vi visual examination is usually not, you know, sufficient enough. Ideally, you know, you should palpate these sites. And the other thing to kind of prevent these, um, you know, phenomena from occurring is to inform your patients, you know, to change their pen needles and syringes daily and have frequent switching or rotation of injection sites of their insulin. Got it. Um, that is the question I had in my mind that is there any patient education to prevent these? So thank yes. you for mentioning it. Yes, for sure, because, um, you know, rotation of the sites is so important. And we always see, you know, sometimes patients have escalating requirements of insulin and we're not quite sure. And, you know, when you once you do the physical exam, you may be able to see in the abdomen that there's a lot of lipohypertrophy. And for that reason, maybe they're having escalating insulin requirements. You know, we often see that um, because, you know, where there, where that hypertrophy is, the insulin may not be absorbed very well in that area. So if they keep injecting there, you know, whatever their dose they're taking might not be sufficient enough and they have to keep escalating. So that's another reason, you know, why the physical exam is such an important piece. The Got other it. Thing Thank to, you. No problem. The other thing to look at um, at these injection sites, which is really important, is to see if there's any adverse reactions in that site. So sometimes, you know, people can have allergic reactions, whether they're, um, you know, whether it's just generalized urticaria, um, but they may also tell you, you know, hey, doc, you know, I've been injecting insulin and I get these painful nodules and they come up under my skin after a few hours. And, you know, that is actually something called an athis reaction. And it's actually, you know, subtender, um, subdermal nodules at the injection site would show up about you know, two to six hours onwards, and they can they can be there for about 48 hours or so. The other thing, you know, you might see with allergic reactions is some sort of delayed, you know, hypersensitivity reaction. Um, I've also had patients come in and, uh, you know, they actually inject their insulin inappropriately, so it's more intradermal. And so you'll see wheel formation as well. So these are things, you know, that again, um, if you, for example, see a patient, you know, injecting their insulin incorrectly just through the physical exam, it's something, you know, we can counsel them on. The other thing to look for in the, in the belly or in the abdominal exam is, you know, patients with type 2 diabetes or even prediabetes um, are very predisposed to fatty liver, you know, um, liver fibrosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So you want to make sure that you always palpate over the liver and look for any signs of hepatomegaly. The other thing um, you'll find is, you know, abdominal tenderness, especially in patients coming in with DKA. So that's another thing that you can look out for. And then since we're talking about the abdominal area, you know, the bladder being right below, you'll see patients, you know, with um, hyperglycemia coming in with a lot of frequent urination. So that's basically the abdomen, I would say. So I think we can move along to the skin now. Absolutely. So now we're coming into um, some very interesting phenomena that we can see. So patients with diabetes, almost in 100% of cases, have some sort of you know, cutaneous findings that are attributable to their diabetes. So the most, you know, one of the most common ones is the ones that we, uh, is the one that we mentioned, you know, acanthosis nigricans, which can be related to insulin resistance and to obesity. But here we have another one, you know, necrobiosis lipotica. So that's actually a granulomatous dermatitis. And um, when you see someone with this, about two thirds of the people who have necrobiosis lip, uh, lipotica actually have diabetes. And it's more common in the pretibial area, as we can see. And it's also more common in women. And we don't really know the pathogenesis of this. Um, but proposed causes include, you know, uh, complex immune-mediated vasculitis. And early lesions tend to look like what's demonstrated in the first photo. 
So it starts off as, you know, an erythematous papule or a plaque, and it tends to evolve. And it becomes more annular lesion-like, and it's usually characterized with this yellow, yellow-brownish color um, with some central atrophy. And, you know, it may also develop into ulcers. And usually, you know, biopsy can be diagnostic as well. So you'll see palisaded granulomas on the biopsy with a lot of like necrotic and sclerotic collagen. And it doesn't seem to actually respond to treatment of diabetes. So early lesions can actually be treated probably with just some topical or intralesional corticosteroids, but more severe cases might need some sort of oral um, treatment with like niacinamide or mycophenolate. Um, and we can probably talk about those things later. But uh, I just wanted to bring that up as well. And then obviously, if there's, you know, recalcitrant ulcers, you want to get, you know, you may require surgical grafting. So another phenomena that we see is um, bullous diabet uh, diabeticorum. So that's actually, you know, um, the, it's, it basically means bullous eruption of diabetes. And it's really bullae that occur in the distal extremities of diabetic patients. And the lesions usually appear as very tense blisters spontaneously, and they're usually asymptomatic. Some patients have a burning sensation around them. But it's pretty specific for diabetes, but it's quite uncommon. And we don't quite understand the exact mechanism, but we do see that patients with severe diabetes that also have um, you know, sequelae of it, like peripheral neuropathy especially, and even retinopathy and nephropathy tend to have it more. So after that, I guess the last one in the corner here is scleroderma adulterum. And that really is a woody induration that we can see most commonly manifest either the over the posterior neck, um, the upper back, and even the shoulders. But it's not so common usually um, over the face or the abdomen or the extremities. So these are some of the actual um, less common cutaneous findings, but they're very closely associated with diabetes. And I guess now we can talk about some of the more common skin disorders. So here we have um, something very interesting called finger pebbles or Huntley's papules. So the incidence of finger pebbles is actually in, in diabetic patients is up to 75%. And as you can see, it's multiple grouped minute papules that are affecting you know, the extensor surfaces of the fingers, and it can be particularly near the knuckles as well. And again, these are asymptomatic. They're extremely subtle in appearance. And um, pathogenesis, again, is not quite understood. The other thing we can see, which is not um, pictured here, is either rubiosis or reddening of the face. Um, we can also see uh, something that's pictured here. It's a skin tag. So there's another name for that. It's acrocordins. And we can also see nail bed telangiotasias. And all of those are very common, about you know, 55 to 65% um, incidence in diabetic patients. The other so, thing... Uh... Mm -hmm. Apologies. Just a quick question. Now, of of yeah. course, as we are looking at these uh, pictures, unfortunate pathologies, uh, we become concerned as well. So there's a question from Bambi Secret. Uh, if all patients, and I'm sure that we'll, uh, we'll come across these in the management right. lectures. Yeah. Bambi Secret says, if all patients had sensors, mm -hmm. for example, Libra, mm -hmm. and insulin pumps, would it help prevent all these complications? So some are actually not linked to the severity of the diabetes, which is interesting. You know, it's a very good thought. You know, nowadays with advancements in technology, there's so much um, scope for even putting a freestyle Libre on someone maybe who's just even overweight, right? They maybe not even have diabetes, but then so much comes with that, not even um, just referring to the skin uh, sequelae that we see or prevention of you know, other things, but what do people do with those numbers? And sometimes it drives up the anxiety of not only the patients, but the providers as well. And some of the manifestations, like I said, are not linked directly to the severity of the diabetes, so they can still occur. Very interesting. Thank you very much. No problem. So the next one that we have here is diabetic um, dermopathy. 
And again, very common, you'll see it, you know, in as maybe about uh, 50% incidence in diabetic patients. And you can see here, you know, there's, there's shin spots or pretibial, um, you know, pigmented patches. And it usually first manifests um, as very erythematous, and then it kind of changes into brown, brown, reddish, you know, macules. And typically they're anywhere from, you know, a centimeter to a centimeter and a half. Um, and again, asymptomatic, and occasionally they can be itchy and have a burning sensation. Like this condition actually is more likely um, to happen if the patient has retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy. So this maybe, you know, would be interesting to see if patients who are monitored with a freestyle Libre, if we can, you know, um, stop the progression, um, if they never reach, you know, the severity of, for example, nephropathy, you know, with their diabetes sequelae. Um, and again, pathogenesis is quite unknown and skin biopsy would be pretty much diagnostic. The other thing that we see with diabetes, which I, I don't have um, pictured here, is, you know, yellowing of the skin, um, yellow nails, and we can even see petechial purpura, um, uh, pedial, pedal petechial purpura. And again, it's, it's very common, about 50% of patients can have it. Another phenomenon I want to talk about with the skin actually um, is something that we might be inducing ourselves, which is, you know, really drug side effects. So these are not extremely common, but I just wanted to bring them up so we can, you know, learn a little bit and see what it actually looks like. So, you know, with a lot of um, drugs from the sulfonamide family, so for example, sulfonylureas, so like your glipizide, chlorpropamide, um, you can often have, you know, photosensitivity. You can even see flushing of the face, you know, especially when patients may be in, engaging in consuming alcohol. Um, another very rare, very, very rare phenomena is erythema multiforme. And even erythema nodos nodosum, you can see. Um, and you can even see it with metformin, but it's, again, very rare. So a uh, quick question for you here. Patty Zig says, can diabetic dermopathy affect upper arms? My ex has that very thing on his arms. I think the question could probably be further that upper arms only and not other parts of the skin. You know, it's classically found um, in the shins or in the pretibial area. I myself have not seen it in the arms. Got it. Thank you. So, you know, that's, uh, I guess those are two of, uh, you know, the drug side effects that we can see with the sulfonamide class. Another thing that we can see um, with, for example, linagliptin is bullous pempagoid. And, um, you know, mechanism is very unclear, but they think it might be due to some, you know, antibodies that are induced with DPP-4 inhibitors. And also, you know, DPP-4 inhibitors tend to increase recruitment of eosinophils in the dermis. So that actually might be contributing to some blister formation and tissue damage. And now moving al along in the skin, I want to talk a little bit about skin infections, which I know um, one of the cool beans had asked a question about uh, earlier. So as I mentioned, you know, skin infections are definitely more common in the diabetic population um, than in, for example, like a control population. And um, generally there's increased incidence of skin infections and that's strongly correlated with, um, you know, their elevated plasma glucose levels. And I'm just gonna walk through some different types of infections that we can see. So, you know, amongst bacteria, bacterial infections, we can see, you know, staphylococcal skin infections. We can see, um, Erythasma, which is, you know, a benign superficial bacterial infection. It's usually caused by corny bacteria, and um, it's, it can be pretty common as well. And then, of course, we have fungal infections, you know, so candidiasis, which is caused by candida albicans. And women are very prone to, you know, vulvovaginitis with this. We can also see it in other forms. So in the mouth, you might see thrush. You might see angular chelitis. 
Um, in the mammary region, you might see intertrigo. And then you have your very common ones, which I've shown here, which is like, for example, paronychia, you know, infection of the soft tissue around nail plate. Then you have oncomycosis, which is infection of the nail. And then one of my favorites is um, erosio interdigitalis blastomycetica chronica. It's quite a name, um, but it's it just referring to candida infection that's present in interdigital spaces. Um, and like I said, you know, if you have patients that are coming in with recurrent, you know, cutaneous candidiasis or, you know, infections that they should be screened for diabetes. And right. I, mm -hmm. Quick question. Yes. Uh, Hafsa Yusud says, which skin manifestation is common? So fungal infections are, are very, very common. You know, and as we talked about, acanthosis, nigricans is very common. Um, the finger pebbles that we see are very common. Um, diabetic dermopathy is very common. Those are manifestations that are extremely common in the diabetic population. Got it. One more question related to this by Hafsa as well, and that is, which skin manifest manifestations present earlier? So it really depends. For example, like some of them really have to do with the actual blood glucose level, right? So for example, um, fungal infections, bacterial infections, you'll see depending on the severity as we were just talking about. With other things, like for example, with, um, you know, with diabetic dermopathy, like I said, they're most likely linked when, you know, a patient has developed sequelae, like the retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy that we look for. So those are things that will come along with progression of diabetes. Got it. Thank you very much. No problem. And then one more thing I just wanted to bring up as an aside is, um, you know, mucormycosis as an infection. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because recently, you know, with I think with COVID-19 and, you know, diabetes, we've heard a lot about black fungus, especially globally. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard on the news in India, especially, they were mentioning a lot of black fungus occurring in diabetic patients that were hospitalized for COVID-19. And just to give you a little tidbit, you know, diabetic patients who are often, you know, glucotoxic or in ketoacidosis are especially prone to mucormycosis. And the reason is mucor actually prefers an acidic pH and, you know, in the presence of high glucose levels, it actually grows rapidly. And it's among, you know, a few fungi that actually can use ketones as a growth substrate. So you can imagine in DKA in a COVID patient who may be on steroids, um, you know, it's the ideal environment for mucor to really, um, you know, proliferate. So that's just a little aside. But we can talk and move on to, you know, the extremities. We can talk a little bit about diabetic hand syndromes. So, you know, with diabetic hand syndromes, the pathogenesis is really multifactorial. And there's many risk factors, you know, age, female gender, longer diabetes duration. So going back to the question that was mentioned, you know, these are, these are phenomena that you'll see longer in the course. A higher BMI. Um, you know, having poor, poor glycemic control and then having micro and macro, macro vascular complications will, will um, you know, lead to this. So, and there's also support that, you know, increased advanced glycation end products and collagen can contribute. So Dupinturus contracture is, is common. It's 20% prevalence in diabetics. And what that is, is contracture of the digits. And it most commonly involves the middle and ring fingers in diabetics. You can also see, you know, nodular thickening of the palmar skin, and that can be associated with tethering. And you can also have induration of the palms. So, you, you know, um, like I said, you know, a lot of that has to do with the glycation end products and the cross-linking of collagen, which leads to a very uh, stiff collagen formation. And that's very resistant to degradation. So that's why you tend to see these deformities come up. That's very unfortunate. Uh, a quick question again, more towards the, the skin. Glenn 
Swag says, is hair loss common? Yeah, so you can have hair loss when you have, you know, vascular disease um, with diabetes. You know, you'll tend to see in certain areas, maybe even on the shins, that, you know, uh, patients with severe vascular complications may not have hair growing and their skin looks very super shiny. Got it. Thank you. So that was a little bit about, um, you know, Dupontrans contracture. And another phenomenon that we see pretty commonly is carpal tunnel syndrome. It has about a 40% prevalence in diabetics. And, you know, modern neuropathies can occur at these entrapment sites. And patients may have wrist pain um, that's, you know, radiating into the hand. And you can check it with a Tinnels or Fallon sign. Um, and then the other thing which we can see is trigger finger, you know, or flexor tenosynovitis. That may also be present. It's a little bit less common than the other phenomena that I mentioned, only about um, 10%. And um, this is really non-infectious inflammation of the tendon sheath of the finger. And you'll see patients often complain of pain and a, and a almost snapping sensation when they flex the affected digit. Um, the other thing we, which we see in the hands, which is very prominent, is um, diabetic chiroarthropathy. Um, so that's another thing, and that's more commonly known as um, LJM, or limited joint mobility. And that can be seen actually from, a, it's, it's very variable in the studies that I've looked into. The prevalence can be anywhere from like 30 to 50 percent. And that's really, you know, limitation in the extension of um, you know, the proximal interphalangeal and um, the MCG and, you know, the distal interphalangeal joints. And you can see here, you know, it can be diagnosed on positive um, prayer sign. And that's when you basically ask the patient to fold their hands in opposition, um, you know, one vertically to the other, keeping the elbows flexed, wrist extended. And then with, you know, they'll have a fixed flexion deformity at the proximal interphalangeal joints, which is suggestive of um, LJM. Got it. Can I ask you one more <laughs> question? Sure. So apologies that I keep peppering you. No, this is great. I, I'm glad I'm, I'm having a good time. The cool beans are having a good time. I hope <laughs> you're having a good time. I am loving it. So the, uh, the question is, so thank you very much for, for the answers. Sky Frog says, are any of these conditions more likely in controlled type 2 diabetes? I think we're all scared that this happens. So we're trying to figure out that if our diabetes is controlled, do we still end up in this situation or do we delay it? What is the outcome if it is controlled? You know, I think if it's controlled, you're, you're, you lessen your risk a lot further. You know, like I said, it's really the longer diabetes duration, the people who have a presence of you know, very poor glycemic control, have a lot of risk factors with their diabetes that's involved, like the higher BMI, or a lot of, you know, complications from micro microvasculature um, that really would, I think, propagate this. Of course, you know, age is also a risk factor, right? Um, as I mentioned, but if you can control the rest, I think, you know, you would, you would slow down this development. Got it. Thank you very much. I, I wish that we could we, we could control age as well, but we can. So. <laughs> We're still <laughs> looking it. for that fountain of you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Priya. No problem. So now, you know, moving on further, um, let's talk about the legs and feet a little bit. So, you know, diabetes is the leading cause of non-traumatic lower extremity amputations in the U.S. And we talked a little bit about, you know, superficial fungal infections, um, a little bit about nail disease. But what I also want to talk about is, you know, autonomic uh, neuropathy. So that can actually result in anhydrosis and promote skin drying. And skin drying can lead to fissure formation. Um, and like we talked about, you know, there can also be, um, you know, changes in the microvasculature. You can have peripheral artery disease. We can have poor wound healing from that. And all of these things can, you know, impede resolution of minor breaks in the skin. Um, it can allow, you know, um, progression of those wounds to then become infected. You can have foot ulcers. 
And this is a major source of morbidity in individuals with diabetes. And so it's very important when we're doing the physical exam to actually check for weak or absent pulses or bruise. You know, so you want to check the posterior tibial artery. You want to check the dorsalis pedis. And in order to identify really spots um, or sites of potential skin ulceration, you want to detect if they have, you know, advanced diabetic neuropathy. And how you do that really is, you know, you can test for sensation through multiple ways. So, you know, one is vibratory sensation. So you actually take a tuning fork. The other one is light touch. So you can use a monofilament. Um, you can also test their crude touch. So you can take a blunt end, end of like a, you know, um, a reflex hammer or a pin and, and test that. Um, you can test pain. Um, you can feel the temperature of the skin. So all of those things, you know, are ways to, to look for peripheral sensory um, neuropathy, which might be, you know, interfering with the normal protective mechanisms that we have. Um, and this would actually predispose, you know, patients with diabetes to maybe sustaining, you know, repeated minor trauma to the foot or sustaining major trauma even. So, you got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. if, if just a quick uh, interjection, Richard Cooper said that uh, real wake up call definitely need to pay attention to my diet. Hope this is a happy ending. There's a happy ending like recommended supplements, cinnamon set steps to reduce sugars, reverse diabetes. So a uh, quick up, update for Richard. Richard, we would have a series of talks here. Today, I wanted to make sure that we are focusing on physical examination. Then we would talk about pathologies, types, clinical outcomes, and then we'll talk about complications and management and lifestyle as well. So in the future coming lectures, we would hit on these topics as well. Uh, sorry, Priya, for the interjection. No, of course, uh, Richard, don't worry. We're definitely going to talk about, you know, all of the carbs that need to be controlled and counted uh, to, you know, help with some clinically maybe, you know, relative or relevant, you know, weight reduction that can help with, you know, managing diabetes. So that'll definitely be there in the future. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for that. No problem. So, you know, going back to, you know, the diabetic foot, you can often have, you know, motor and sensory neuropathy um, that can lead to, you know, abnormal foot muscle mechanics. Um, so, you know, you can have muscle wasting actually, and that can even be seen in like the calf, the thigh area. And a lot of this muscle wasting actually is not, to contribute in part to actually structural changes in the foot. So there's several factors which contribute to that. So, you know, it could be the sensory motor neuropathies we're talking about. It could be the autonomic neuropathy we're talking about. It could be, you know, multiple re uh, repetitive trauma. It could be abnormalities in the bone, like osteopenia or fractures. Um, and all of these things can actually contribute to foot deformities that we can see. So some of them that we can see are, for example, hammer or claw toes or charcoal foot. So, you know, for example, neuropathic osteoarthropathy is actually a acute localized inflammatory condition. And it can vary in degree based on, you know, bone destruction, um, dislocation, osteolysis. And, you know, at some other point, we can go into how pro-inflammatory states can, you know, uh, stimulate osteoclast. Um, but that's, you know, a mechanism through which things, um, you know, deformities can form. And um, the hallmark um, of, you know, neuropathic um, osteoarthropathy is associated with a condition called midfoot collapse, which is described as a rocker bottom foot that we can see here. The other one that we see often is um, clawed toes. So, you know, that's really when you have flexion of the proximal and distal, distal interphalangeal joints, and you have extension of the, the meta, me, metatarsal um, phalangeal joints. And that's also been associated sometimes between differences in the, the foot muscles of extrinsic and ex, um, intrinsic foot muscles. The other thing that you can look for, um, which is important, is actually loss of reflexes. So it's important to check um, the ankle reflex when you're taking a look at the foot as well. And then before I you know, conclude, 
Uh, today is, you know, um, uh, World uh, Suicide Prevention Day. And so another part of the physical exam is uh, affect, right? Or your psych exam. So um, people with diabetes are actually predisposed to um, mental health disorders like anxiety and depression by two to three times more. Um, so it's very important to assess that as well on your physical exam. So, you know, we walk through a whole spectrum from head to toe and with vital signs um, in what we can see in patients with diabetes. And I hope everyone learned a lot. Um, and it was really a pleasure being here. I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Moby and thank you to all the cool beans for being so engaging. I really enjoyed the questions and I would be more than happy to receive more if you wanna follow me on Twitter. So thank you. So Priya, thank you very much. Uh, this was fascinating. I really, really wanted to put together physical examination in one place for patients to, to understand what a doctor is looking for and especially for the healthcare professionals, for healthcare students to understand for diabetes, there is a slew, there is such a widespread uh, pathology that almost every part of the body is involved and in how we should look at that before we understand more about the diabetes. So you did a great job. Thank you so much. No problem. And you're absolutely right. It's just, you know, diabetes affects every single system in the body. And so, you know, you really have to look at a person from head to toe to really see how they're doing. But I hope, you know, everyone really enjoyed the session. I know I did. We did. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully we'll have you soon with the next topic. In the next topics, we would start with the classification and the types of the diabetes and the pathologies underneath. Then we'll do pathologies. Then we'll do management of it, complications, prognosis, lifestyle, food-based uh, remedies, and so on. So Priya, once again, thank you very much. And Cool Beans, thank you very much for your time as well. I would see you on Monday. Bye-bye for now. Bye.